And good evening, everyone. Happy Friday. Tonight was a big night for Donald Trump, who discovered that after all, at least to the criminal justice system, he is no different from anyone else. Despite his fame and political prominence, he, he can't just publicly abuse witnesses because he's on the campaign trail. The judge who taught him that lesson today is named Tanya Chutkin. I have a bunch more to say on her in just a bit, but we begin the readout tonight with something along those same lines. And it is the truism that sometimes things are not as they seem, even when they involve Hollywood stars and former president. For example, today in Hollywood, actors and writers continue to walk the picket line, still unable to reach an agreement with the studios and producers like Netflix. A reminder that while our perception is that Hollywood is this glamorous place where all the actors and writers are fabulously rich, for the vast majority of them, that isn't true at all. Artifice is a big part of Hollywood, making you believe things that aren't real. The same is often true in politics. The Washington Post reports this week that Tommy Tuberville, the Alabama senator currently holding up all U.S. military promotions due to his opposition to abortion, including leaving both the Army and the Marines leaderless, and whose obstruction appears to have cost Alabama the headquarters of Space Command, which will now remain in Colorado, reportedly doesn't even live in Alabama. The Post used financial records to confirm that the senator actually lives in Florida. His wife has a Florida real estate license even, and he hasn't, hasn't actually lived in the state that he represents for years. They even included a link to this video in which Tuberville says that after retiring as a football coach, he moved to Florida. But Tuberville got elected to the Senate not because he was a good politician or had great ideas. He got elected because he was a famous football coach who used to coach at Auburn University in Alabama. So Alabama Republicans gleefully replaced actual civil rights hero and one-term Democratic Senator Doug Jones with Tuberville. Because it just, it just sounded right to them, right? Auburn coach becomes Alabama senator. And if his voters don't like the fact that he doesn't actually live there, well, they're out of luck until 2026 when he is up for re-election. Tuberville, of course, is not the only interesting character living in Florida. Roger Stone, the Proud Boys, Michael Flynn, Javanka, and of course, Donald Trump lived there too. Trump moved to Florida after he became president, after building a career in New York that convinced most people that he was a successful real estate billionaire. So powerful was that myth that he landed The Apprentice, which turned him into a celebrity. And then he became president of the United States. Same formula as how Tuberville became a senator. And, and I just don't think that people think enough about how much the artifice that got him here is why it is so hard for people who support Trump and even some who don't really, to believe that he committed crimes, even when the evidence says that he absolutely totally did. People enjoy believing in Hollywood mythology and worshiping the rich and famous. It is endemic to American culture. Remember the show Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? It was a huge hit, just like The Apprentice was. And for a lot of people who look up to Trump as a rich celebrity they idolize, it is just easier to believe that he wouldn't commit crimes because he wouldn't have to. He's just being set up by his enemies. And while the actual facts say no, Joe Biden did beat celebrity president Donald Trump. The idea that Trump really won just seems more believable to a lot of fellow Americans. The famous guy winning just makes more sense to them. And Trump has used that perception of himself to grow his support into something more than fandom. He's used his celebrity to grow himself a religious cult. And he's using his super fans' ardent support to try to build a wall around himself that he hopes will keep him out of prison. Because all he needs is one super fan on his juries to throw the government's case against him. All he needs is just one friendly judge. Hey, Florida. He just needs one juror who believes that all celebrities are rich and rich celebrities don't commit crimes. But what if America in next year's election once again chooses the real politician over the celebrity? I mean, it is likely to happen. A poll roundup by political strategist Simon Rosenberg shows a consistent three to four point lead for Biden. It's an outcome that could trigger a replay of 2020 all over again if Trump goads his supporters with the big lie 2.0. We also have to consider the flip side. What if he wins? Let's just entertain this frightening hypothetical for a moment that it's November 2024 and Trump is declared the winner of the election. Nightmare scenario, I know. But what if Democrats, Democrats in key states, object to certifying his electors? 
based on the 14th Amendment. It's a question two constitutional scholars tackled for more than a year. And then they spoke to The New York Times. These are conservative scholars, I should add, who are active members of the Federalist Society, the conservative legal group, and proponents of originalism, the method of interpretation that seeks to determine the Constitution's original meaning. One of those professors, William Boddy, summarized their conclusion, saying, quote, Donald Trump cannot be president, cannot run for president, cannot become president, cannot hold office unless two-thirds of Congress decides to grant him amnesty for his conduct on January 6th. This is based on a little-known provision of the 14th Amendment, which bars people who have engaged in an insurrection from holding government office. The intent was to prevent the president from allowing former leaders of the Confederacy to regain power within the U.S. government. Congress can remove the prohibition, the provision says, but only by a two-thirds vote in each House. Now, of course, these findings don't change the fact that Trump supporters are determined to elect him again. But they will boost, they will help boost these lawsuits that could be filed, arguing that Trump is indeed ineligible to be president. Professor Michael Stokes Paulson, the second scholar, said, quote, there are many ways that this could become a lawsuit, presenting a vital constitutional issue that potentially the Supreme Court would want to hear and decide. Joining me now is Lawrence Tribe, who has taught constitutional law at Harvard Law School for five decades. Uh, it's great to see you, Professor Tribe. I, I am officially obsessed with this uh, scholarship by these Federalist Society judges that I don't normally say that. But what's fascinating about it is that what they're saying is that it is unquestionably fair to say that Donald Trump, this is what they're saying, engaged in the January 6th insurrection through both his actions and his inaction. And therefore, they say that under Article, uh, under the 14th Amendment's Article 3, he cannot be, even in some cases, added to the ballot to be president of the United States. And people can sue over that and make that claim. What do you make of their argument? Well, I think that there's a great deal to be said for it. You don't have to be an originalist, somebody who thinks that the Constitution's meaning has to be excavated from the history and what people understood it meant at the time. In this case, it's simply the straight-up language. 14th Amendment, Section 3, says that anybody who takes an oath to uphold the Constitution and thereafter engages in or gives aid and comfort to an insurrection, cannot hold any office under the United States, period. Now, back in, I think it was the spring of last year, Judge Michael Ludig, a distinguished conservative, and I both wrote that we thought those words meant exactly what they said. A lot of people have said, oh, no, um, you have to take them in light of an 1869 decision rendered by Chief Justice Chase in a case called In Ray Griffin. Well, these two scholars do a terrific job of shredding that circuit court opinion by one Supreme Court justice. So what is left? Well, what's left is a kind of practical argument. Some people say that provision can't be self-executing. It can't just rise up out of the ashes and grab politicians and say, sorry, you were an insurrectionist, you can't run. There has to be implementing legislation under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. But there's nothing in there that suggests that you need new legislation. And anyway, all 50 states have laws called quo warranto laws, laws where you can ask, by what warrant do you hold this office? And the only modern decision applying this language used that law or something just like it in New Mexico to say that a county commissioner who had actually taken part in the insurrection, though he hadn't been convicted of any insurrection crime, only of trespass, couldn't hold his office. Now, an appeals court never ruled on that because the case became moot. He, he lost an election. But I would imagine that whenever Donald Trump tries to run in any particular jurisdiction, the secretary of state of that jurisdiction, whether on the basis of this article or a little more obviously on the basis of 
you know, this little pamphlet, the Constitution of the United States, <laughs> just read it and say, wait a minute, you can't, you can't run. Now, he will say, I was never convicted of insurrection. I was only convicted in the District of Columbia under the indictment brought under other laws by Jack Smith. I'm assuming, perhaps, he will have been convicted before the election. Right. But it is clear you don't have to be convicted of insurrection in order to be disqualified. Now, when Michael Stokes Paulson says, I think the U.S. Supreme Court is going to be eager to rule on this, I, I beg to differ. I don't know about that. You know, they could easily duck. Uh, lower yeah. courts could say, as a matter of real politic, we're not going to take this old language. We may be originalists when it comes to other things, but, <laughs> you know, here we're, we're going to find a way out. So I'm not sure what's going to happen, but it is clearly a major issue overhanging any possible Trump presidency. And yeah. I think it's going to be a major political issue going forward.